Thanks everyone for joining us. Welcome. I am Kira Epstein. I'm the coordinator, the program coordinator at the New School at Commonweal. And today we welcome Wayne Jonas, MD, to the New School, talking with our host and director, Michael Lerner. We will be talking about how whole person care can become part of routine oncology. We are recording this conversation and we'll have produced audio and video files available on both the New School and the Cancer Choices websites. You can also find all of our recordings on the New School's SoundCloud, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify feeds. Okay, now I turn things over to Michael. Again, thank you all for joining us at the New School of Commonweal. Thank you, Kira. And Wayne Jonas, welcome. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Michael. And we also have today, and they will be joining us later, uh, Nancy Hepp and Laura Pohl, both senior staff on cancerchoices.org website and uh, full partners in um, this extraordinary work. Wayne, uh, you and I have known each other for a very long time because we've both uh, been engaged in integrative health care and um, specifically cancer medicine for much of our careers. And I'm simply so honored to have you with us today. I was thinking to myself this morning that if one were to make a list of a handful of people who have dedicated their careers uh, in significant part to integrative cancer care uh, and who have had a profound impact on the field, you would be high among that handful of people. And because of your uh, significance, uh, uh, I really want to take the uh, the time to inter to introduce you uh, briefly but significantly. Um, you are a practicing family physician, an uh, expert in integrative health and health uh, care delivery, a very widely published scientific investigator, a retired lieutenant colonel in the medical corps of the United States Army. Uh, you were uh, from 2001 to 2016, president and CEO of the Samueli Institute, which is a very influential nonprofit medical research organization supporting scientific investigation of healing processes in the area of stress, pain and resilience. You were director of the Office of Alternative Medicine at NIH from 1995 to 1999. I believe, were you the founding director, Wayne? Uh, yes, I was. That's mm -hmm. correct. Um, and uh, prior to that, you served as director of medical research fellowship at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. And you're currently the executive director of the Samueli Foundation's Integrative Health Programs, an effort supported by Henry and Susan Samueli to empower patients and doctors by providing solutions that enhance health, prevent disease, and relieve chronic pain. And at this moment, as I understand, having launched an entire effort in that area, you are now quite focused on cancer as the specific area of work. Do I have that right? That is correct. That's one of our main areas of focus. Yeah. So our subject for today, uh, its initial focus, is catching up on the science of cancer care. But from there, uh, and uh, weaving into it, we're going to address uh, uh, three other issues. First of all, catching up on the science of, let's say, whole person cancer care. Secondly, why patients and physicians urgently want integrative cancer care. Third, why it's so hard for them to get it. And fourth, why the way we evaluate whole person cancer care is so radically inappropriate in terms of scientific methodology. That is to say, integrative cancer care is not getting a fair shake scientifically and why it's so hard to fix it. So those, we're gonna start uh, with your presentation on catching up on the science of, can of integrative cancer care or whole person cancer care. But then we'll go on to ask why patients and physicians want it so much, 
why it's so hard to get and why it doesn't get a fair shake. So with that, I will turn it over to you for your presentation, and then we'll come back on to explore these other questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for that introduction and uh, overview of what uh, we'll try to address here. Uh, it, it First of all, let me say it is an honor to uh, be uh, you know, talking with you and your team about this and working with your, you and your team about this. And uh, I am just so impressed by especially some of the recent activity that you've done with cancer choices and the evidence issues and that type of thing. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, we can we can also address some of those issues and what role that might play in addressing all the questions that you uh, that you just mentioned. Uh, the idea of whole person cancer care, uh, what is it? Uh, why is it so difficult to to find it, to, to research it, uh, and that type of thing? I think is um, uh, hopefully I'll address some of those in uh, my brief talks here, my brief uh, presentation at the beginning, uh, and then we can certainly elaborate on that as we uh, as we go along. So what I'd like to do is I know the the, the title is catching up uh, on the science of care, and I'm going to talk about what that is. But uh, I want to sort of think a little bit about uh, and uh, 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 speak a little bit towards the end about what the future of cancer care might actually look like. Uh, you know, cancer has come a long way and cancer care has come a long way in the last, uh, you know, uh, 30, 40, 50 years. If you look back uh, at how it was treated and addressed uh, that long ago, it was horrendous. It was absolutely horrendous. Uh, the uh, you know it was often a death sentence, uh, and the treatment was in many cases worse than the disease in those areas. And because of the investments that have gone on in cancer care in the mainstream, uh, the improvements have been incredible. They have been great. Uh, the suffering is less. The idea of uh, supportive care has gotten more prominent. Uh, breakthroughs have occurred in isolated areas uh, to, uh, to, in some cases, even cure a few cancers uh, or reverse them uh, and to prolong life. Prevention has gotten more prominent in the discussion as we under, understand the causes uh, the, of what produces cancer. And so the advancements from the, the multiple so-called wars on cancer that have occurred and the scientific advancements in these areas uh, have, uh, uh, have really improved uh, the type of care that we get. That being said, much of that knowledge is not being applied. Uh, and uh, in the day-to-day -day, uh, delivery of cancer care, for the vast majority of people who get the most common types of cancer uh, and who live sometimes for years, oftentimes with, for years with those, we have not brought in uh, the, the research around the cancer and the cancer cell that we already know. Uh, and it's not being delivered in those areas. And so I, I want to address that because I think there is a huge amount of science uh, and there's also a rethinking that's required uh, if we're going to uh, continue to improve uh, on cancer care. Let me start by uh, talking about the goals of something that is very recent in the current federal administration. It's called the Cancer Moonshot. This is the second iteration that's going on right now that was uh, announced uh, several months ago. Uh, it is uh, what uh, is purported to be up to a $1.8 billion investment by the administration uh, to try to improve cancer and cancer care. As you know, uh, President Biden's son, uh, died of cancer, and he has a lot of personal experience in his family uh, about uh, the ups and the downs, the ins and outs, the pros and cons of how that care occurs. If we look at the goals of the cancer moonshot, they're incredible. They're, they're, they're exactly what people want in wording. 
uh, to reduce the death rate from cancer by at least 50% over the next 25 years. That's pretty ambitious to improve the experience of people and their families living with cancer and surviving cancer, the quality of life, not just the quantity of life. And to end cancer as we know it. And I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I'm going to speculate and make some suggestions about what would be the most profound way to end how cancer is currently known, which is often uh, as a death sentence or something that will generate fear in the future uh, when the word comes up. I think to address these goals, there are a number of opportunities and challenges that occur. And I don't think anybody would disagree with the goals that they've put out. But the question becomes, is this just another war on cancer? And I say just because we've had many of those. And while they have produced some of the advance, advance, advances I've mentioned at the beginning of this, they have also uh, only produced incremental efforts if you look at the overall cancer um, uh, progression. Uh, are we using what we know from the science? And we'll talk a little bit about what we're not using to see how we can do that better. Are we satisfied with incrementalism? Breakthroughs that are often announced uh, from the rooftops of a new drug for treating a cancer, if you look at what they actually do, is incremental. And I'll show you the data on that. Does the regulatory system as it's currently structured serve people with cancer? If not, uh, how does it need to change? Does the industry actually serve people with cancer? They certainly say they do, but are they doing it effectively in the way that people need it and want it? And what policies are hindering us getting to the moon? <laughs> if we need a moonshot, it means we want to and need to do something radically different to rethink the way we're doing this. And so I'll address a little bit of that. So there was a very wise man who wrote in a book several decades ago uh, this phrase that I pulled out. His name was Michael Lerner in Choices in Healing in 1994. And he said that cancer is not always experienced as the greatest problem facing a person with cancer. And so I'd like to take that theme to, to explore some of the questions that I've uh, just laid out. What then is the greatest problem <laughs> that people with cancer are facing? I think one of the things that cancer does that, uh, although not unique only to cancer, is one of the more prominent things that occurs when a person hears the word and is diagnosed with cancer. Cancer intensifies the experience of life by facing people with the clear possibility of suffering and death, which under other circumstances is something we all normally ignore. We all are faced with a very short period of time in life and we all experience pain, suffering, uh, death and disease of some type. Uh, but most of the time we go about our day and it doesn't disrupt or interfere with how we think or function. But when the diagnosis of cancer occurs, suddenly it's in our face. And suddenly uh, the intensification of that uh, time trajectory, the amplification of it occurs. This provides us with an opportunity that really very few other illnesses or events uh, do. And that is the opportunity to decide on how to respond. One way to respond to that is out of fear of the future and all the activities that go with that, such as creating a war <laughs> to destroy that experience. Another opportunity, however, would be to learn how to live now, in the now, in love and joy, appreciating the fact that we are not experiencing suffering and, death now, suffering and death now, and that every moment is precious. I dare say that, uh, that the first response is the one that most people uh, react with, and that our industry and the cancer, uh, collectively the cancer response uh, has, been, has been producing. 
And this, I think, is creating perhaps the greatest problem with the diagnosis in cancer. People living with cancer and the teams who treat them, they often speak in two completely different languages. One speaks of the war on cancer, on killing the cell, and the other one talks about the need to heal, to be whole, to, uh, to have a uh, reduction in suffering, and if they have to die, a peaceful death. If the cancer is gone, but without prolonging life or allowing the person to live with a high quality of life or as normally as they can, then I would suggest the treatment may not be achieving the person's goals. And therefore, it should not necessarily be the only thing that we focus on. And this is a, these are actually two other quotes by a veteran, uh, a VA, a Veterans Administration Oncologist, and a leader uh, in the Integrative Oncology Leadership uh, Collaborative that I'll mention and uh, talk about in a minute by the name of Alyssa McManaman. Here is what is happening by responding out of fear. And this is a, a summary of what uh, the, la the, the last 17 years of the development of novel cancer therapies approved by the FDA and therefore ones that uh, we have access to have produced. This, evalu this study published in uh, JAMA uh, Open uh, evaluated 92 novel cancer therapies for over 100 indications over 17 years and looked at how they were approved, what evidence they were was used to approve them, uh, and uh, then make them available, and then looked at the mean absolute increase in overall survival. And in that entire period, almost 20 years of FDA-approved drugs, the average overall survival improvement was only a little more than two months. And this two months has come and often does come at great cost, not only economic cost, but cost of the side effects and the anxiety uh, that these produce, as most of these drugs are very good at killing the tumor, but as this data and other data shows, not very good at prolonging life. And yet this is what is approved by the FDA and therefore made available uh, to people diagnosed with cancer. A lot of this and the reason for behind, behind it has been summarized in a number of books. I'll only illustrate the one here. This is by uh, Vinyard uh, Prasad. He's an associate professor of oncology at the University of California, San Francisco. Here's a book where he summarized it called Malignant, Malignant <clears throat> How Bad Policy and Bad Evidence Harm People with Cancer. And here's a few things that he states. Breakthroughs are rarely actually breakthroughs. There's an exaggeration of the treatment as the norm, as the companies and the investigators attempt to hype uh, the successes that they've done, which are often incremental. The costs are obscene, unregulated, and those harm people. What he suggests is that we need to change how we measure what matters to cancer patients, do pragmatic studies <clears throat> on average patients, not just selected ones that go in clinical studies, raise the bar on the quality required for approval, not let the industry decide on what they think should be allowed for approval, but patients to do that, and have that evaluation be done by unbiased advocates, not paid industry consultants, or the uh, companies or regulators uh, that are in their pocket. When a person is diagnosed with cancer, these two worlds, that of the patient and that of the oncology team collide. And there is information overload for everybody. On the right-hand side, we see the oncology team seeking to kill the cancer cell, monitor it, uh, address it with the various tools that they have. And this takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of cost. On the left-hand side, we see what the patient may all may bring and the team that they bring with them, family and friends, uh, that they're trying to deal with in life. And these things are, uh, are often not discussed uh, in the interaction between the cancer team and the patient's team in those areas. 
Uh, the oncology team holds the resources and holds the power, uh, and very often the patient gets disempowered, and therefore what the goals that they have are unheard and unaddressed. So what do we need to do to address these three things? And there's many other issues in, in this uh, management area, uh, but I wanna do sort of the bottom line up front here and say there's a number of things that are needed if we're going to change this picture. First, the mindset, and this is most important, the thinking about cancer, war versus healing, and the model of cancer care that follows from that is not working and it needs to be re-examined. Uh, Second, to achieve Moon's Chot and all of our goals requires really a redesign of the way we deliver cancer care and needs to take into account the science of what is sometimes called the terrain, but I call the microenvironment and the macroenvironment around the cancer cell and not just the cancer cell itself, because the science shows that it's not simply about the cell. It also needs to take into account the inner environment, the social, emotional, spiritual, and mental state of the person, and not just the physical environment uh, of the body. An integrative whole person cancer care model provides that kind of unifying framework if we're going to achieve the, the kinds of goals that the moonshot has talked about. And surprisingly, there's, there's quite a bit of guidelines and quite a bit of evidence for why we need to do this, why we need to promote whole person care, but the current policy, the funding, and the delivery issues are not there. Therefore, we need policy focused on paying for a redesigned way of delivering care in a way that could rapidly catalyze this and make it routine and regular. We need to shift the time, the thinking, and the money if we're going to achieve those moonshot goals that we all want. What does this mean in terms of our models of care? If the goal is to make whole person integrative care routine and regular on oncology, we need now to bring the person into the cancer decision-making process and not simply the cancer. And there's many models to do this. Integrative oncology is one of those illustrated on the right. I like the idea of making sure we address the whole person uh, because I think the whole person uh, is uh, consists of not just the body, but their behavior and lifestyle, their social and emotional components and the spiritual and mental aspect. And I'll show you tools we've been using with oncologists around the country and through the leadership group to try to uh, insert that into routine cancer care. Here's a quote from uh, somebody on my staff who works for me, one of our program managers that I just love. I put it up. Uh, she wrote this about, a new, she calls it a new vision for cancer care. It is holistic, person-centered, and it allows people to alleviate fear and to thrive while effectively treating and living with cancer. It's a fully integrative, and I would say integrated model, in which the elimination of tumors is critical but insufficient because five-year survival is simply a means to that bigger and more important goal, human flourishing. As I mentioned, the evidence is here. If you look at guidelines from the top leadership groups, the uh, uh, ASCO, the NCC, uh, NCCN, uh, the Society of Integrative Oncology, uh, there are multiple guidelines uh, that talk about caring for the person. Uh, however, there are multiple obstacles for that, and we can talk further about that. One of those is a lack of medical education on how to deliver this type of care. Uh, a second is that simply change is difficult. There's inertia there, and it's hard to actually shift uh, systems to do that and address things like lifestyle, nutrition, and stress management, which are often not considered medicine. They're considered something the person has to do, uh, but we don't have the, the resources and the tools or training to do that. And then finally, billing and reimbursement systems do not pay for these services. Uh, despite the science being there, they pay for the killing of the cancer. Whole person framework, a whole person mindset, mindset would, would address this, and there's extensive evidence show that, showing that it produces better outcomes 
improve patient experience, improve clinician experience. Physicians and nurses like to do this type of care and that even the drugs that we have perform better if they're done within this context. This is the challenge that we need uh, to deliver. We recently uh, did a study along with uh, Terry Crudnop uh, and published in um, uh, Integrative Onco uh, the Journal of Oncology, in which we uh, looked at organizations that were delivering uh, whole person care and integrative cancer care. And we rated them in four different levels from minimal rating all the way up to full access um, and, uh, and exceptional types of delivery. And we found that even providing six very, very simple ways of addressing whole person care, like nutrition, spiritual care, stress management, exercise, and physical therapy, uh, that that uh, correlated with improved five-year survival odds in breast cancer patients, even if you just did the minimum, much less the maximum in those areas. Uh, so this works both for the quality and the quantity of life. But if you look at where we're investing in the research to get the information that we need in order to be able to do this type of care, there is a huge imbalance in that. The kill the, kill the tumor war on cancer paradigm, and I've listed some of the approaches there, chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, and targeted and increasingly immunotherapy have a huge amount of money in there uh, invested because this is where the money is to be made when you get FD regulation. This focuses on the tumor. On the, on the other side are the integrative cancer components that address the terrain, the microenvironment, such as the microbiome, metabolic components, diet, natural products, inexpensive off-label drugs, lifestyle uh, changes and vaccines, and pennies on the dollar are invested in this area. Uh, rarely can they get FDA approval uh, because they don't have sufficient resources doing the research there. And so these are left off the table. Interestingly, there is now a new breakthrough in cancer care called immuno-oncology or immunotherapy. And it may provide the bridge between these two uh, because it's addressing both the cancer and the terrain and the environment in those areas. And that is now gaining traction. So this may be a way of actually shifting this balance uh, in a way that the science says we should go. New models of care are needed. And here's one that, uh, that we published for healthcare in general, but it applies in cancer just as equally. It's called the two circle model for whole person care. And what we propose is that we need to create an entire units, if you will, or departments that are focused on being the patient advocates and the patient champions to bring whole person care into the care uh, process. On the right-hand side is the standard medical services that we get when you engage in, in the industry and with your oncology teams. And on the left-hand side are the things that address what matters to the patient. And I'll show you uh, some of the tools to access those areas um, in, in, in this kind of paradigm. There are systems around the world that are now trying to redesign and are creating patient champion units to address the whole person care items in order to actually effectively deliver them within cancer care. Now, a redesign will not be effective if we don't have the tools to make it happen on a day-to-day -day basis in the office, with the con in the conversation with the patient as part of the team uh, in these areas. And unfortunately, the tools that the uh, that are learned and that are delivered and that are embedded in the electronic medical record do not do this. Uh, we've created a set of tools specifically to do this. Uh, we call them the HOPE Note uh, Toolkit. HOPE stands for Healing Oriented Practices and Environments instead of the SOAP Note, which addresses the disease. Um, and it consists of these four areas, the personal health inventory, which is a simple questionnaire for opening up the conversation about what matters to the person uh, rapidly, an integrative health visit, 
or a hope note and uh, that documents that visit. And this is the, what the team had, the discussion the team and the oncologist can have with the patient. And then a personalized healing plan with supportive resources along those uh, aspects. And uh, we've been working, as I'll show you, with a number of uh, cancer care sites around the country and actually around the world uh, to take these tools and, and insert them into their day-to-day -day care. Here's, here's this the, the, the patient-focused tool. It's called the Personal Health Inventory. It's a simple two-page thing that can be filled out very quickly prior to the visit. The first thing it does is talk about the dimensions of the whole person. So the, the people know what they're talking about. Okay. And I'll show you what those are in a minute. And it asks, how is your health and well-being as an opening discussion? On the back side of this, it asks you what matters to you in life to address what's important. Uh, and, which may or may not be the tumor itself. <laughs> uh, what is important in life? Uh, what brings you joy and meaning? Why do you actually want to engage in this kind of care? And then finally, what are your personal determinants of health and well being? What are the things that you could get empowered and engaged in in order to facilitate uh, your uh, treatment and your health uh, now that you have this diagnosis? Then the conversation with the cancer care team occurs uh, using a whole person integrative approach and using the framework and the questions called the HOPE note, the healing oriented practices and environment questions. These questions address four areas, which uh, we found uh, uh, remarkably successfully cover most things that people wanna know about what are important in their life. It does talk about the body and the external issues, their environment, the places they live, the resources they have, uh, the, uh, deter the social determinants. It talks about the behavior on lifestyle, which we now have extensive evidence make a big difference in terms of the quality and the quantity of life. It talks about the social and emotional dimensions of an individual, and it talks about the spiritual and the mental components. These four dimensions are the key aspects of what a person is. And if they're not addressed, we have not done whole person care. That gets then documented and inserted into the services that are available in many cancer centers. So the HOPE visit is there to engage and empower the patient, make them part of the team, and then help them access the layers of, uh, of uh, healing uh, that are often available, but uh, not actually delivered. This includes things like self-care uh, components, like nutrition, activity, sleep, and stress, the core wellness aspects, the supportive services that are often available, such as physical therapy, nutrition, art, uh, supplements, psycho-oncology, acupuncture, mind-body practices, and then uh, the various uh, uh, types of care that are recommended in national guidelines, such as palliative care, survivorship, uh, financial toxicity, and equity issues. So it's a mechanism for actually making this real and routine in practice. For the last two years, we've been working with a group of oncology centers around the country and also some outside of the country in uh, a, uh, a collaboration called the Integrative Oncology Leadership Collaboration, the goal of which is to make whole person care routine. And they have been attempting to do health services research to translate these tools into operational care and seeing what the challenges and barriers are that. Uh, are there and how to actually overcome them. So let me end by uh, envisioning what it might be like to actually have a future care like uh, that uh, care system that truly addressed the whole person. Here's an example of what we do now. And this is a composite drawn from an individual. This is actually the journey that they had. This is not the person nor their name. Um, they were diagnosed with stage uh, three uh, colon cancer. And after the diagnosis, they had surgery, staging, and some genetic testing. The effects were, as is often the case, fear, denial, and seeking out on the internet uh, other kinds of treatments uh, without uh, necessarily good guidance or evidence. 
Uh, they look up the data and are shown that they have a 37% uh, five-year survival, which, if not managed properly, feeds their fear if they think it applies to them. Then in the treatment phase, they go through surgical debulking and very intensive chemotherapy, which produces bowel dysfunction, immune suppression, neuropathy, fatigue, and early retirement. They gain from this 12 months tumor-free, and if they're lucky, two months of life. If they go into remission, they then are monitored with CT scans every three to six months and increasingly tumor markers. Uh, this um, uh, often uh, causes fear, distress and anxiety, so-called scanxiety and uh, depression as this idea of uh, possible imminent death, which is not imminent, uh, is in their mind. Uh, they may have elation if their scans are negative and gratitude or depression uh, and uh, a PTSD if they're positive. If they do then get a recurrence, uh, they are put on second line chemotherapy, even though the ability to prolong their life uh, is not there for the evidence and they may get some increased tumor free survival at the cost of disability, diminishing quality of life, loneliness and despair. And then towards the end of their life, palliation kicks in. Uh, we have good medications for that now for pain management and nausea, rehabilitation, uh, but they're often bedridden with pain. And if they don't get good high quality palliative care early enough, uh, they will continue to have loss of joy, guilt, regret, uh, and not end with a good uh, acceptance and reconciliation that they seek. This is the normal journey that people like this have today. But what if we actually had both a science and a delivery system that provided whole person care? What would this uh, look like if this was done? And notice I put this in the future because I don't think it's easy to get this, but all of these things are within grasp. They're available. The science is there for implementation. At diagnosis, there are a DNA screens and ex vivo sensitivity tests with tumor markers that then help identify the specific combinations of treatment. Thus, you have concern, uh, but you're implementing behavior change and a commitment uh, to see if your individual cancer gets relieved. Uh, the chemotherapy may be low dose, especially if it's done in combination and targeted. You might have other supportive things added like IV herbals or C. Uh, you could probably avoid resection because you're now tracking the regression of the cancer and the side effects were mitigated. Real-time adjustment can occur and off of it at home. The hope here is that you now have 87% uh, uh, five-year survival and have an additional five years longer even after this staging. During the monitoring phase, we can do it with blood, so-called liquid monitoring and immune markers or the microbiome. And there may be prevention vaccines as options that then keep uh, it at bay during the monitoring session so it simply isn't watch and wait. We know there are dietary changes, exercise and activity changes throughout the continuum of care, and there may be off-label drugs that affect the metabolism and the terrain or other supplements. Thus, there are multiple options, modifications uh, that can help you maintain a routine life. If you have a recurrence, you have the normal types of scans, but now we're actually testing for other things, the so-called hallmarks of cancer, and altering uh, the terrain through things like uh, uh, fecal microbial transplant, which alters the immune system. Immune phoresis and, and immunotherapies are available with much fewer side effects. Yes, this is inconvenient. Yes, it may be expensive, uh, but it provides hope, and it uh, is concern, not despair increasing your life, likelihood of living longer with quality. Finally, we all die eventually, and at the end, if you die of cancer, the palliation might kick in. But the hope is that with whole person care, your social and emotional and spiritual aspect will be upfront uh, and done early, not in the last couple months of life, or even the couple weeks is often the case. There'll be local uh, treatments to alleviate symptoms, uh, things like cannabis and herbs that all can help with quality of life, new drugs and psychospiritual approaches uh, that help you uh, address 
uh, some of the fears that this brings. This can be delivered through home care uh, to minimize the pain, minimize the guilt, and let everyone have the final discussion that allows them recognition of their life, acceptance, and a peaceful death. Let me return to this wise quote from uh, Michael Lerner at the beginning. Cancer is not always experienced as the greatest problem facing a person. And I would suggest this last aspect, a peaceful death, which is uh, a blessing that we, a, a Chinese blessing, I understand it. May you have a peaceful death is actually one of the more important things that cancer care should be providing. But if the idea of hope and a peaceful death is continuously disrupted throughout the cancer journey, then we have failed in one of our most important goals in cancer care, bringing hope throughout this journey, not simply uh, the hope that the cancer is eliminated, but the, the hope that the suffering and the death uh, that is attached to that word is no longer empowered. I hope moving forward that we can uh, get this con these concepts, this type of care, this type of research into the mainstream. That's the goal of the Samueli Foundation and the work that I do, uh, working with those who deliver cancer to average people on a day-to-day -day basis, basis like ASCO, the Society of Integrative Oncology, American Cancer Society, the Communities Cancer Centers. Uh, if we can do this, over the next uh, you know, five or more years, then making whole person cancer care routine and regular will alleviate uh, and achieve the moonshot goals. Thank you very much. Wayne, thank you so much for that. That's such a powerful presentation. I'd just like to take one moment of quiet together just to let this sink in for us all. Peace, peace. Wayne, it's so extraordinary. Um, as you know, uh, we've both been doing this for many decades and have been friends and colleagues. But hearing you put it all together, which I haven't heard for a while, um, there's so many powerful points. And I just want to raise up for his people. One of them is how how much public money total has now been put into cancer research with the war on cancer and the moonshot and so on? What roughly have we spent? Boy, that's a great question. Now, the moonshot itself is uh, seeking to deliver $1.8 million in this round. Uh, I think it was a similar amount in the in the first round, which you was said during the Obama million or billion 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 yeah, billion yeah. dollars. Sorry, did I say million? Uh, One point eight billion dollars. Right. Uh, and so that is just this round. Uh, I think the National Cancer Institute's budget is uh, somewhere around what fifteen billion dollars a year, something like that. I believe I have I haven't looked at it recently, uh, but it certainly is uh, has gone up regularly. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, I'd like to love to go back and uh, that'd be a good question to go back and see since uh, Nixon's original, I think it was Nixon's original war on cancer uh, started to uh, up the amount of resources that go in this. Uh, it's definitely in the tens of billions of dollars. And if you were add, if you add in the industry investment in this, we're getting into the trillions of dollars uh, that have gone in, as I pointed out, the vast majority into attempting to get rid of the last cancer cell. Right. So if we think about it, tens of billions of dollars, including industry trillions of dollars, the net outcome, if I understand, is an additional two months of life average. Well, that's what the 97 drugs uh, over the last 17 years ending in 2020 produced on average. That's correct. FDA approved drugs. That's it's really extraordinary, isn't it? It's sad. It, it says to me that the paradigm we're using, the war on cancer, the kill the cancer cell, is uh, not adequate. It's not working very well. And as I proposed, I think the reason is because the science of the 
environment. The micro and the macro environment has not been brought in uh, to this investment process. But if it is profoundly sad, but if one thinks about it purely from a scientific point of view, we've had tens of billions or trillions of dollars invested in cancer research for a decade since Nixon. And the net impact on the survival of cancer patients is very minimal. Yeah, it's very, well, it depends. The, the positive impact is minimal. Uh, the negative impact has been pretty substantial. Right. I, I would say from the, the public money that's gone into this, however, has created the knowledge that we have now that we could use. Okay, that's been incredible. That's fair. That's fair. That's absolutely fair. But simply allowing ourselves to not just hear it go by, but really experience the scale of the misdirection of public resources when when the science, as you point out, is fully available to indicate that whole person cancer care should be standard care in oncology, not only in the United States, but around the world where so many other countries follow the lead of the United States. And yeah. I mean, just the, the collective blindness that enables us to overlook the size of the tragedy and misdirection. I just, I think sort of allowing that to sink in is pretty fundamental to moving all this forward. I agree. Yeah. So uh, you you talked about so many uh, important things, but um, one thing we didn't touch much on that I heard you say at a scientific meeting we were both at with the top experts in the United States on uh, integrative cancer care research. And uh, there was a fine gentleman uh, presenting the latest version of the hierarchical system for evaluating research. And at the end of his excellent presentation, you spoke up and you said, you know, that's great for evaluating pharmaceuticals and chemotherapies, but when it comes to whole person cancer care, this hierarchical system doesn't work. And the fine gentleman who had made the presentation said to you, Dr. Jonas, I agree with you. It doesn't work for that. And so here we had this group of the top evaluators of the methodologies for integrative cancer care and the guy pr making the presentation agreed with you that this didn't work. So I've read in, in your books, and I also have heard you speak about, that rather than that hierarchical system, you have a system that you call the house of evidence. So my question to you is, first of all, could you explain your idea of the house of evidence and why it's what we need as opposed to the hierarchical system. And then the follow-up question is, how could we take your house of evidence concept and actually implement it? Because on the call, you said in this set setting, you said, who's going to fix this? The National Cancer Institute's not going to fix it. The Food and Drug Administration not going to fix it. So it's not going to get fixed from within. So what is it if if we understand the house of evidence and we understand that integrative cancer care is scientifically not getting a fair shake? It's simply not getting a fair shake in view of the amazing amount of resources that we've put into something that has delivered so little on the positive side and so much suffering overall. Then how do we move your house of evidence and the different methodology we need for evaluating whole person cancer care, how do we move it forward? Well, those are several great questions, uh, Michael. Yeah. Um, uh, so let me tell you a little bit about why I think the hierarchy of evidence that's currently used needs to be changed to something like a house. There's other models also. Uh, and that is when you ask uh, the question, 
uh, what is good evidence? Uh, you can't answer that question unless you say, for who? That is, who's going to use the evidence to make what decisions? And there are multiple decision makers in healthcare. There are the regulators who are the obviously decision makers, the insurance companies. Uh, there are the basic scientists <laughs> who make uh, don't make a lot of decisions about it. They're the clinicians. But most importantly, it's the patients. The patients are making decisions about, is this of value to me or not value to me? The evidence hierarchy is structured so that a certain type of decision maker is preferred over others. It's at the top of the hierarchy. It's the regulators. It's those at the FDA. It's the insurance companies, et cetera, who are trying to differentiate what they should pay for. And it's a drug-like model, okay? And this is what we say is the best evidence, but that means it's only for one group. Uh, if you're a patient or a practitioner who's out uh, in the world where 95% of the patients who don't get entered into that type of evidence, the clinical trials at Purdue, only 5% of patients actually enter the clinical studies that lead to that evidence. So it means 95% are different in some way. Um, then often what they want to know is they want to know, is it going to harm me? Is it going to cost a lot? And what is the possible benefit that would make it worth my time and effort and engagement in that? So uh, they're number one, want to know about safety, and they want to know about the probability of benefit. So what are the chances if 100 patients like me happen to get this, that I'm going to get harmed or not? You don't, that has not come from randomized control trials. That comes from observational or health services research. Uh, and that type of evidence is the type of evidence uh, that is lower down on the hierarchy. But if you have a house, okay, in which it's one type of evidence for certain type of decision makers, then it gets more value and it's not devalued. So this is the reason why we need to change from the hierarchy, which empowers certain decision makers, but disempowers uh, the, the community practitioner and the patient by saying your type of evidence is not important, it's not real, we won't pay much attention to it. And so that's what's needed in those areas. And I think, um, you know, there we need to make the understanding that uh, the current evidence uh, that is called good is good for specific decision makers who are trying to make a decision about regulatory processes and payment issues, they're not necessarily trying to make it, uh, the decision on, is this good for you as an individual patient? That takes uh, other types of evidence. Doesn't mean you don't want to know that type of evidence, but it means you also need additional evidence, especially about safety. Where this is important in integrative oncology is so many of the things that are offered in behavior, in lifestyle, et cetera, you can't do a randomized placebo-controlled trial of those. And they are also much safer. They're not going to produce the side effects. And so if you took safety as a lead, uh, then you would say, I want uh, the benefit evidence, the probability of benefit as the primary type of thing. And that would not be the top of the hierarchy. It would be farther down, but it would be the most important type of evidence for you. Now, one of the things that you and I have talked about and you are writing about uh, is uh, the importance of placebo in uh, healing. And I've heard you say, please tell me if I have this right, uh, because I may or may not, that if you step back, that 80% of health outcomes are non-medical. That is to say, 80% of what happens to our health is not related to medical treatment. And then if you go into medical treatment, that 80%, if I have this right, of the impact of the treatments themselves have to do with placebo, with your belief in the rituals that you're undergoing. Now, do I have those two numbers correct or not? 
Well, what I wrote about in my book, Out Healing Works, which was not focused on cancer, it was focused on healthcare in general. Uh, the data clearly shows that it, medical treatment produces about 20% of health in our population and in an individual. So the other 80% comes from other aspects that are not part of the medical treatment system. Right. Behavior, lifestyle, social and emotional, stress, uh, psycho-spiritual components, all of those things together. Uh, now, placebo is one element that examines that. Okay, so it's not placebo isn't 80 percent, but uh, the placebo uh, is a term that we use to sort of cover the ritual of care, the beliefs, the communication processes, the delivery part of any kind of treatment. Uh, and that produces very large effects uh, the, uh, because the ritual of care produces and in, empowers and engages and um, uh, stimulates or catalyzes our own inherent healing capacity, which is going on all the time or we wouldn't be alive. Okay, in those areas. And uh, and yet what we look at when we do the placebo controlled trial and we only accept the small amount that's added over that ritual, then we're saying that's the only thing that's of value, that part that the drug produces. But the way that it's delivered can actually produce a huge amount of healing. And so we should open this up, pay attention to that ritual and make sure that the way we're delivering treatments, OK, is uh, is uh, in fact done in an optimal way to optimize the so-called placebo effect in those areas. So I think that uh, it's not that placebo produces 80 percent. It's that the ritual actually can occur. It was a great study done by an anthropologist on what is the magnitude of placebo effect. He wasn't looking at cancer. He was looking at high blood pressure and ulcers and variety of other things. And he showed, and others have done this too, he showed that depending upon whether you optimize the ritual part, the belief, the expectation, uh, and the social context of delivering, he called it the meaning effect, Dan Mormon from the University of Michigan, you can vary the effectiveness of even proven active drugs uh, from as little as 0% all the way up to 100% just by the way you deliver it using the same drug, okay? Uh, the drug itself is a works, okay? It's been proven to be a little bit beyond placebo, but the placebo can, can eliminate that effect if it's a nocebo or negative ritual, or it can magnify and optimize that effect if uh, it's done uh, properly. So when we think about conventional cancer care in light of the placebo nocebo continuum, um, how do you think about that? When so the way I think about it is uh, that in the way I teach my medical students, residents and, and others uh, to, to, do the, to, to utilize this, is I uh, say, when you're making decisions with patients, uh, I call it the five Ps, use the principle of the five Ps. Number one, protect them from something that's harmful, okay? There are things out there that are harmful, either harmful directly because they're toxic or harmful indirectly because you're using them uh, in place of something that works and they may not work or harmful in the sense that they cost a lot of money or cost a lot of time. So first protect people from that. Uh, number two, permit things that are safe and not harmful, not too costly, but they optimize the person's own belief, expectation, and meaning in their own treatment. They empower the patient to engage in the so-called you know, placebo effects. Permit that. Let that happen, even if it's not proven uh, to be effective over that. Okay, so that's number two. Number three is promote things that have been promote, have been proven uh, to engage in, in activate healing, and they have you know, a specific treatment effect, okay? They've been proven like a drug, okay? These should be available to everybody, okay? And those areas. Always look at and partner with the patient because their preferences and engagements are the ways you actually uh, allow, access that other 80% of healing beyond the treatment component. So you have to partner with them to see what their beliefs are, 
are what their um, desires are and uh, utilize that kind of a paradigm. So I, that's how I recommend uh, patients uh, or providers uh, work with patients in order to do that. I'm going to ask uh, Nancy Hepp and Laura Paul to join us now, two senior members of our cancerchoices.org team. And while they join us, uh, one other question I want to ask, mm -hmm. which is, uh, given the evidence that you've uh, provided to us, uh, why wouldn't insurance companies, uh, 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 healthcare organizations like Kaiser, uh, and for that matter, Medicare, uh, why wouldn't a whole set of actors in this be strongly financially motivated to implement this? I mean, I get why the pharmaceutical industry, why, uh, you know, um, physicians, when they are reimbursed by procedure, why hospitals and so forth, uh, why they have strong interest, but I don't see why the insurance agencies, why Kaiser-like systems and why uh, Medicare wouldn't be strongly uh, motivated to adopt this and why uh, an effort to bring this to public attention wouldn't be a strong driver to moving all of this forward. Well, if... Um... If uh, those who were actually paying for the care and looking for value from that had control uh, over what was delivered, uh, that would logically make sense, right? That would probably happen. Uh, but uh, that's not the way it happens, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> You and I are paying for the care through the government, right? And through our taxes, okay? But we have practically no control over the pricing. We have no control over the regulatory process. We have no control over the access uh, to uh, uh, the information. We have no control over the science, okay? Um, the other big payers are uh, private self-insured companies, OK, so these are companies that are paying for the health care for their employees. Uh, but until recently, they just saw it as a benefit that they had to pay. They didn't understand the value and the cost of these areas. It was, you know, they're they're in a different business. OK, uh, they're trying to produce their widget or produce their services or something like that. And they just had to do it. So they just paid the healthcare industry to do it. Uh, and until the costs went up so much that now it becomes a huge impact on their bottom line, uh, they've said, well, gee, I better figure out if I'm paying for it uh, um, in, a, in a way that's giving me value, like, you know, I figure out all my business practices. Uh, and so that means I have to understand it. Well, it's very difficult to understand because it is so obscure and opaque. Uh, the pricing, we have no idea what goes into the pricing for most uh, kinds of services. Drug costs, okay, unbelievably varied over these areas. We don't really know, okay, where is their value in these areas? Insurance companies simply are managing the money and taking some off the cost. So they have no incentive to reduce the stream of money that's going into those areas. The more bigger stream, the you know, more we'll do it, you know, more we, we get out of it. And so the decision makers in these areas are uh, and the payers are not in the mix. OK, and they don't have authority or control over that. And so the money continues to go up. And unfortunately, uh, the industry now and this is, uh, you know, uh, more so in cancer than than in many, many other areas, uh, they also are paying the regulators. Okay? And they're also lobbying from those who make the regulations, the lawmakers, and provide resources for there. You know, pharmaceutical companies are one of the biggest uh, lobbying groups, uh, and they also have to pay the FDA in order to have their drugs evaluated in those areas. And they often pay for the research that the academics do in those areas. And so uh, you and I, uh, you know, have very little say and companies have very little say, and even the government has very little say in those areas. It's unfortunately, uh, this is the, the main reason there's not an alignment rationally between uh, the money and the value that we get out of it. That's fascinating. Laura Pohl, as a long-term colleague, uh, uh, expert, our, our clinical authority for cancer choices, you've been listening to this. What are your reflections? 
Yes, I first want to just start off with a reflection on um, placebo, belief activation, fear. So Wayne, uh, in one of your drawings, you had about the fear that's in, that's stimulated and the, the way can, conventional care is given and the decision making process. And I think my first a uh, year in oncology, so I was 23 years old. And um, the uh, oncologist wrote the prescription for the chemo that was to be given to this woman. And she said, he wrote down, patient requests that Laura Pohl give this chemo. Now, what I wanna say is I was one of the least experienced in giving chemo and starting IVs. This was my first year. And the Cracker Jack nurse who had the most uh, clinical experience, well, she was afraid of the chemotherapy. She was afraid of how strong it was and you know the side effects. And um, I figured that this patient picked up on the fact that um, I wasn't gonna go about this with fear. And that when um, I sat with her, because I had to sit with her for like 30 minutes, um, we were going to be calm. I was going to actually sort of pray that the chemotherapy would do what it needed to do. And, you know, I would suggest imagery to her. So people, providers, I hope if there are any listening that you see how powerful your presence can be. And I've seen that over and over in my career. And even the words you use when you give, say, a pain medication and you you begin to say, here's what you can expect that's good out of this. And when you come back, uh, instead of saying, well, how's your pain now? Uh, say, what relief do you notice? So I think our presence can be extremely powerful. And if our presence can convey peace and calm and uh, belief in what our treatments can do for people and uh, ameliorate that fear. But so many healthcare providers are working under stressful conditions. Um, we had a unit that they were looking at, you know, sending nurses home because we were having issues with, with money. And I'm like, how can a fearful people care for people who are already scared? This is just not the way to do it. So I just wanted to comment on that. I think belief activation and your presence is so powerful in what we do. And then another thing I wanted to comment on is you mentioned that 44% of drug approvals um, in this study that you cited were based on non-randomized controlled trials. And what I wanted to say I've noticed is it's interesting how integrative oncology is almost held to a higher standard. You know, so, you know, I'm not going to do this therapy that you're suggesting or I'm not going to uh, condone you doing it because there are no randomized clinical trials for this. So in some ways, we're held to a higher standard. And that's um, and as you mentioned, uh, doing research uh, of multiple therapies, which is often the case in integrative care, doesn't really hold to that model. And um, so I wanted to mention that. And, and, and Nancy, I don't want to uh, uh, guide you to where um, I, I, some comments, but I would love if we could show how Cancer Choices um, looks at evidence um, and, and shows that there are different, that different types of evidences are needed. Like you mentioned safety, um, Wayne, and I think we're trying to address that uh, with Cancer Choices. Thank you, <laughs> that's really helpful. Let's give, uh, Nancy, let's do that, but uh, Wayne, why don't you, respond first to uh, a couple of Laura's comments, and then we'll bring Nancy into it. Yeah, so I'll just mention on the belief side, there's a great book I recently read by Steve Bierman uh, that uh, was called Beyond Pills and Procedures, uh, Healing Beyond Pills and Procedures. Uh, uh, he's an emergency room physician who 
discovered, uh, knew about the placebo effect, but then discovered hypnosis and started using it in the emergency room. And he found out that uh, when there's a big power differential, like there is with a physician and a person that feels helpless and is suffering, that's automatically a hypnotic type of situation. And so those words take on more power. And he found that by specifically languaging uh, the communication to the patient, he could actually induce physiological effects like you see in formal hypnosis, okay? So he could actually direct people to have less pain, painless injections, painless uh, um, suturing to reduce their bleeding rapidly and to accelerate healing. And he has techniques now that he teaches uh, for people how to do that. And he wrote this book about that. So that's an example of words. Uh, One of the things he says about cancer is that when you take the probability data that you look up online and say, oh, you've got X number of uh, chances of this, that's based on large amounts of individuals on average. If you then say that is your probability and you're pointing to the patient and saying that, you're, he calls it a curse. Yes. Okay? <laughs> because now you're saying this is you when you have no idea whether it's you. That's, you know, 5% of the people that have been in the clinical studies. It may or may not be you, okay, in those areas. And so communicate to them about what science actually tells you. Probability data may or may not be you, but then make sure you utilize that communication in a way that enhances their hope accurately. Yes, that's Stephen Jay Gould wrote about the same thing for himself. The median is not the message. So what can I do to put me on the other side of the bell curve, the other side of the median so that I live longer and better? Yeah. Great. Yeah, I'm going to look right. up that book. Thank you. So that's where the communication issues come in to that. And, and we need to do that, especially in, in cancer. Um, you know, on your question on drug, uh, uh, you know, approvals, you know, it used to be that, uh, uh, well, at least that there's a large debate that drug approval should be based on overall survival. And then the regulators uh, were able to convince the FDA, the drug companies were able to convince the regulators to convince the FDA that we should do surrogate measures, mm-hmm. uh, such as progression-free survival. That means show me that, you know, you can shrink the tumor or keep it from growing, right? Right. Again, focus on the cancer, not on, you know, the other aspects of the person. Uh, Well, you can find drugs to do that. You can develop drugs to do that, okay? Uh, And a lot of the approvals that uh, showed in the study are based on that kind of measure, okay? Uh, But they actually don't prolong survival, okay? Because they're simply killing the cell. Well, what if eating beans, as a, a researcher from um, uh, from uh, MD Anderson showed uh, in an observational study, eating beans in melanoma reduces your risk of recurrence uh, uh, by thirty percent. Okay, <laughs> um, you know, is that you know, first of all, it's going to be difficult. I think she did it in a randomized control trial. In fact, um, uh, you know, but why wouldn't you do that? What's the safety issues around eating beans? Uh, The drug might actually reduce your chances by 30%, okay? But if beans can do it from 30%, why aren't we all recommending beans? Okay, make a decision about the drugs if it's approved or not, but eat more beans, right? And that's, you know, it's part, and it's just an example of the diet component of that and how it just doesn't get actually into into these uh, areas. So anyway, I'll stop there and and let uh, Nancy. Uh, Nancy, uh, let's here. bring you in. Where would you like to go, Nancy? Laura made a suggestion, but we'd like to know what you'd like to add. Well, I don't feel like I have enough worthy to add. Um, we have a question out from a member of the audience that I would defer to, which is uh, Bert Rosen. I hate to ask that question, but will Dr. Jonas share the slides? You know, uh, Bert, they will absolutely be part of the uh, recorded presentation and completely available to you in a week or so. So uh, and then secondly, why doesn't he show palliative care extending across the treatment timeline? Now, that's a really good point. Uh, I'm sure, Wayne, you'd like to address that. Yeah, Yeah, great question. And uh, that's exactly right. I mentioned in the example of the hypothetical patient in the future uh, that they implemented palliative care early, okay? 
Uh, and um, uh, and uh, I think uh, the evidence to show why you should do that is there. There are studies, some pretty very good studies, showing that early palliative care not only improves quality of life, but prolongs life. Uh, as as is indicated there. And so it should be implemented, you know, from day one, in my opinion, uh, in terms of uh, cancer care. Uh, a lot of those kinds of things are the same kinds of supportive measures that you get in supportive care and you get in integrative care. Uh, they're uh, not necessarily focused on killing the cancer. They are focused on altering uh, the patient's perception, environment, stress, uh, metabolism, et cetera. And those should be done very early in those areas. And I think if we were to optimize those, we would see prolonged survival. And I'd love to see that research done and more of that research done, as I indicated, including palliative care. Absolutely. So Nancy, coming back to you, uh, why don't you, uh, well, let's talk, uh, Wayne talked about uh, the terrain or the environment and you just uh, uploaded a, a new contribution to that area. Do you want to tell us about that? We have an overall handbook showing the uh, effects of that body terrain, your personal nutritional status, your inflammation, your immune function, your blood sugar levels, all of these kinds of things and how those impact your risk of cancer, your survival, your experience of side effects and such. And just today we published a full handbook describing high blood sugar and insulin resistance and how those interact with your cancer experience, promote wellness and healing, and just create an environment within your whole body, your whole being, which is less supportive of cancer. Wonderful. Uh, and I just want to remind everybody that cancerchoices.org is uh, where you will find all of our work on this. It's quite encyclopedic. We keep building it. Great. High blood sugar and insulin resistance. There it is. Um, do you want to say anything about it, Nancy, beyond what you've said? We highlight why this is important and the evidence behind that. But we, it more essentially, if we highlight what are the most effective therapies that we know of that can help you manage these other than uh, the conventional treatments, which your doctor will recommend. But you can take control of a lot of these. You can be in charge through your self-care practices. Wayne has mentioned several of these, the, the diet, the exercise, sleeping, uh, your body weight, and also complementary therapies, which are the supplements and uh, other practices such as yoga and, and particular diets. And we have very good evidence on many of these things that these can help you manage this terrain effect. Well, Wayne, coming back to you for our last eight minutes, um, uh, this has been so extraordinary. I just find it so powerful the way you put these things together, even though I've worked on them for over 30 years, uh, um, uh, actually close to 40 years. And one thing that comes to me is when one presents this kind of information to patients and the patients are in treatment and they want to believe in the treatment that they're getting, right? And yet, there's all this evidence, sadly, that a lot of these treatments aren't likely to increase survival and, and may, may cause a lot of suffering. And so it seems to me a very delicate balance. Um, and I wonder how you do it when. Uh, you are aware that actually the probability that this is going to extend life for a patient is not high, and the probability that it's going to cause suffering is high, and yet the patient believes in it, and it would actually create tremendous cognitive dissonance for them to absorb that 
while this is what their doctors recommended, this is what everybody does, this is what the hospital says to do. So how do you, when, when you're counseling somebody you care about, and I know you care about all your patients, how do you deal with holding those things in your mind and at the same time supporting the patient in what he believes is the right thing to do? So that's a great, a great question, um, Michael. And it, it makes me want to point out <laughs> that despite all the information and the science and the evidence that this you know, talk was oriented around uh, that exists, the greatest amount of uh, knowledge that we have uh, in these areas is uncertainty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that the, the biggest uh, uh, ability, the biggest thing that we encounter <laughs> in life in general, in health in general, and certainly in cancer too, is that we don't know. Uh, that we are in uncertainty. Let me give you an example. Even the the best done, top of the hierarchy, if you will, uh, multi-center randomized placebo control trials, which tell you the uh, effectiveness of this intervention uh, produces X percent improvement over this outcome. That's probability data. That's data that's already passed. And the chances that that will apply to you is unknown, okay? It's like percent. We're dealing with, you know, 10%, 5%, even 50%. That means the majority of it is unknown. It's uncertainty. So how do we deal and live in a world of uncertainty without fear? <laughs> okay, how do we do that? Well, uh, there are several ways, I think, uh, that are mostly mind-body types of things that are important for that. And I'll mention two. Number one, you have to trust your intuition. You look at the facts, you look at the data, you realize that, you know, this is all we know and all, most of it we don't know. And therefore, you have to go inside. You have to say, what does my gut tell me fits for me? You have to use your intuition because your brain is constantly synthesizing and maybe more than your brain, okay, is constantly receiving, organizing information uh, that cannot be represented in graphs and facts. So don't ignore that, okay? Intuition is very important and use both of those types of ways of knowing. The second thing is that make sure that the team you're working with is including you in a trusting way into the process of healing, into the journey of healing. And how do you tell that? They actually are listening to you, okay? They're listening. And if you're a provider, cultivate the skill of listening and hearing what the person is saying on the surface and the message they're delivering to you underneath that. And that means sit with them, think about it, um, hear them, let them express themselves. Don't interrupt them, <laughs> you know, in seven seconds um, in those areas. And I think those two things allow us to deal with that kind of uncertainty. And out of that can emerge a diminution of fear and, uh, and a, a rise of hope that allows us to live this moment and this day with a fully joyful life, no matter what the diagnosis or the prognosis is. Well, Wayne Jonas, uh, we could go on for a long time with you, and I do hope we will have you back, but I can't thank you enough for this extraordinarily powerful summary of uh, the decades of research and clinical experience that you've had uh, in the policy arena as a physician uh, and truly as a human being who understands um, the psychological and spiritual dimensions of life and health and healing as well as anyone I know. So thank you again for being with us and uh, we look forward to future collaboration and exploration and continuing to make whole person cancer care the standard of care in cancer medicine. 
Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Nancy, Laura, uh, Kira. Uh, uh, it was an honor to be here. Thank you very much. Kira, back to you. All right. Well, thank thank you, Wayne, for being with us. I mean, uh, we really appreciate your time and resources and all that you have done for whole person cancer care. Just a reminder, if you want to rewatch or re-listen, uh, if you want to share the conversation with others, we will have recordings produced in about a week. And if you're on the New School or the Cancer Choices mailing lists, or if you follow the New School feeds on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube, you'll be notified when the recordings are posted. And we'll have another joint Cancer Choices New School conversation coming up in the new year and more to come on that. Uh, So thank you all for being with us at the New School at Commonweal and for joining us today. We'll see you next time, everyone. Don't take it, don't, 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 don't take it, don't, 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 don't take it, don't, 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 don't take it, 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 don't, 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 River is a healer, the river is a sink. The river knows no end and the river feels no way.